So th thank you all for joining us today. So I want to share with you a little bit about what the Red Cross does around the world and share with you some of the new approaches and the innovations that we're doing so that we can reach more people, do it faster, and do it cheaper. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's important to start framing for you some of the global challenges that we do face. So the last two years in particular, we've seen some of the biggest and most complex humanitarian crises in history. Fourteen months ago, we saw the most powerful storm ever on record hit uh, the Philippines. One million homes were damaged or destroyed. Syria, Ukraine, Iraq, and other conflicts have forcibly displaced more people today than any other time since World War II. It's the equivalent of the entire population from Florida through D.C. being forced out of their homes with minutes notice, if even, because of violence. And of course, we've also seen Ebola. It leaves generations of orphans and it's created the state where these, these fragile countries, which are only just coming out of civil war, are threatened. And although I'd like to think that 2015 is going to be much more hopeful, much less uh, issues, the trends that we're seeing are suggesting that what we've seen over the last two years is really just a foreshadowing of the future. So as the American Red Cross, there's four major themes or four major trends that we're, we're closely following. The first is the increase in the number of disasters and the number of people affected by disasters. This isn't a, just a global trend. We're seeing this also in the United States. Over the last 30 years, we've seen a fourfold increase in the number of people impacted by disasters. 200 million people annually are affected by disasters around the world. That's the equivalent of a Haiti earthquake happening every five days. The meteorologists tell us that Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, that the, the, the typhoon that struck the Philippines, these are just going to be the norm ahead, something that we all have to be prepared for. The second trend that we're following is urbanization. And you're seeing it here in the Tampa area. And we're seeing it in every major city around the country and around the world. More people are moving from the rural areas to the urban areas. Five years ago, we actually hit that mark where more are now living in urban areas. Uh, the UN projects that between now and 2030, we'll actually see 70% of the world's population living in an urban area. They're living on coasts. They're living in flood areas. They're living susceptible to storms. And they're living near earthquake faults to put them even in greater risk. One in every seven people in the world lives in a slum. Last year, I was in Nairobi in Kenya and visited some of our work in one of the larger slums there. And just to paint a picture for you, these are homes that ha are maybe eight foot by eight foot that may have five or six family members living in them. These are homes that are made out of wood, maybe some tin. There's no running water in these communities. Just like most urban slums, they grew around the center of the city. There's not the infrastructure there to support what the, what the population is. You could reach from side to side of this street, and you could touch both buildings on either side. In Nairobi, one of the chief challenges that they have, just like here in the US, are fires, fires in these homes. And when one home catches on fire, the whole neighborhood goes up. These are tinder, block, tinder boxes. The third trend that we're following are what I call silent emergencies. Of these 200 million people that are affected every year, 80% of them are affected by floods and droughts and tornadoes and epidemics, things that don't make the nightly news and generally don't get the donor's reaction. But yet a family who's left homeless by a flood, a family who is displaced or they lose their job, because of a tornado, a family who is separated from their loved ones because of a war, it's as much of a disaster to them as the family who has their disaster covered by CNN. And then the final trend that we're facing, somewhat related to measles here, and one that we have within our immediate grasp to change, 
is that so many people in the world are dying of preventable and easily treatable diseases. Last year, seven million children die before they reach their fifth birthday. That's a tragedy, but ev I consider it even almost as tragic as that two-thirds of them died from easily treatable or preventable diseases or conditions. We have vaccines that can help treat people and protect the children. We know the importance of safe hand washing. We see the impact of putting a bed net in a home and even having the children just sleep near the bed net to protect them against malaria. But these families, unfortunately, have to make choices. They lack access to many of these available and well-proven technologies. A mother in Africa has to make a decision when they have their child born. Do they take that child and travel on foot, by bus, as many as two or three days to the nearest health clinic to get their child vaccinated? Or do they stay at home and tend to the family, cook the meals, fetch the water, care for the younger children in the family. And too often, these mothers have to make that choice. And too often, their choice is not to seek that health in, in, that's available for them. There's health services that are available for them. And to understand how the, op the Red Cross operates around the world, I think it's also important to paint a picture for you on who is the Red Cross. So we heard some numbers from Holland and America. We heard some numbers from Northern Trust. So I'll share some numbers, too, for the Red Cross. So the Red Cross is the world's oldest and largest humanitarian organization. We've been around for over 150 years. In that period, our, our work has been honored with four Nobel Peace Prizes, three more than any other organization has ever received. We have a massive scale and massive scope to our work. We have a presence in essentially every single country, every city, every village in the world. We have an amazing network of volunteers. Like you do here in Florida, we have a network of volunteers around the world that come from the communities that they work in. One in every 500 people in the world is a Red Cross volunteer. One in every 500 people. Because we've got this great global network, we're able to quickly mobilize resources, people, goods, money. And because we've got this amazing distribution system on the ground, every year the Red Cross is able to reach one in every 25 people in the world. Just think about that. One in every 25 people in the world every year is assisted by the Red Cross. So last month I had the opportunity to meet with the president of the uh, Syrian Arab Red Crescent. Red Crescent is the so how they use it there, but it's the equivalent of the Red Cross. And he was sharing with me some stories about the work of their volunteers. And he showed me a, a cell phone video that he had taken uh, two months before. And it was of the Red Crescent volunteers in the street, walking through the streets of a, one of the smaller towns in Syria. And then all of a sudden you hear this gunfire. And you see these people turning a corner and running away from it, as of course most people would do. But you see these volunteers doing just the opposite. You see these Red Crescent volunteers running towards the gunfire, towards the fighting, because their job is to help people in need. He shared with me some news that he received uh, just the day before, that they lost three more of their volunteers in the line of duty. Bringing the total number of Red Crescent volunteers who've died in Syria since the war began almost four years ago to over 40. These are people that every morning, understanding the risk that they face, put on their Red Crescent jersey and go out not knowing what that day is going to bring knowing that they're literally putting their lives on the line to help strangers. And we see these courageous volunteers in every single country, every single community around the world. So what is it that the Red Cross does? So it's not too different than what we do here in Florida. It's not too different than what Linda was talking about. The first thing that everyone knows the Red Cross does is we, we respond to disasters. Big disasters, small disasters. When there is a large disaster and it's beyond the ca capacity 
of the local Red Cross Society around the world, they'll call in for international assistance. And we can send in people, goods, resources. So for the American Red Cross, we operate as part of a larger humanitarian network within the global Red Cross uh, system. Everyone has a specific role that they play. So the American Red Cross, for example, our role is to lead efforts to distribute food and relief supplies, as well as in the early hours of a disaster, is to set up an IT communication systems. The Canadian Red Cross and the Japanese Red Cross, they're responsible for field hospitals, running field hospitals. The German and the Indonesian Red Cross societies, they're responsible for building toilets and helping to provide clean water. The Danish and the Italians, they probably have one of the more important jobs. Uh, their jobs are to run the base camps where all the relief workers stay. They help feed and they help house the relief workers. So if you ever find yourself in a Red Cross base camp, little word of advice. The Danish run the best well-organized camps while the Italians have the best food and the most fun. <laughs> so this combination of the Red Cross with its local operating network and this global network come in when there's needs for assistance, the Red Cross every year is able to help 70% of all the people in the world that are affected by disaster. So again, this amazing scope, this amazing scale in what we do. In a crisis, I think everyone would agree, people need food, water, they, they need shelter, and they need medical services to survive. I'd also add on top of that that they need family. Because if you have family, you can often unlock those other four areas. And the Red Cross values the family. We have a program that's designed, it's actually part of our, our charter. When a government signs the Geneva Conventions, they say that the Red Cross will help relocate people that are separated by disaster, separated by war. It's a service that we provide here in Florida. It's a service that we provide in every single country around the world. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit one of our programs in Colombia, in South America. Colombia, as you may know, has been in this prolonged war. You have these rebel groups, the FARC, uh, who has created a crisis and a, very a great deal of instability in that country, in addition to just having some acute poverty there. One of the villages that we visited was um, uh, incredibly poor. Uh, the Red Cross provided a mobile health clinic. We would go from these communities to communities in the rural areas and in the outskirts of the cities, and we would set up vaccination posts, health screening. We would even set up a, a dentist office there. These are people who did not have access to other, uh, other health services in their communities. So as I'm walking through this community, I noticed a couple things. One that I noticed is that the homes were all built of cardboard and scrap wood. Incredibly, incredibly poor. The other thing that I noticed is in the village, there were only women and children. So I was wondering about that, and I was thinking, about, well, maybe the men are out working, maybe they're in the field, or probably more likely the men are probably out drinking. Uh, so I asked one of the women, I said, where are the men in the village? A and she told me a story. She told me a story about their village, their old village, that a year before, in the middle of the night, the FARC, the rebel forces came in there. And they knew, they had their own preparedness plan, they knew for mere survival what to do. They had all the women and the children run in one direction, and all the men and the older boys run in another direction. Understanding that the rebel groups would only chase one of those groups, but not both. So the women kept on running and running and running, and after two or three days of running, they found this plot of land, and they set up this camp. And a year later, that was their home. So in addition to providing this medical care, the services that we were also providing is helping to re reunite them with their missing brothers, their fathers, their, their, their husbands, or at least to find information about their, their fate. Because the Red Cross has this neutrality, because we have this trust, because our volunteers come from the communities that they work in, because they wear this Red Cross on their, on their shirt, 
because they've been in existence for 150 years and we are the most neutral humana humanitarian focused organization I would say that's out there. The Red Cross is able to have conversations with the FARC and we were able to find the fate of many of their loved ones. Sometimes it's good news, sometimes it's not so good news. But for those families, who the mothers, the, the sisters, uh, the children who, who lived for a year not knowing where their relatives are, any news helped them move on. So when disaster strikes, we know we can't always predict when it will happen and where it will happen. But we know the importance of preparement, preparedness. We know the importance of simple messages and simple actions that can be taken before a disaster. We know that this saves lives. This is why we're doing the fire campaign here in the United States. This is why in Vietnam we have a school-based disaster preparedness program where we're training the kids what to do if there's an emergency during the school day and we're training the kids what to do if there's an emergency at home. And those kids, just like my kids, come home and tell their parents about it and they push their parents to develop their own version of a disaster preparedness plan. This is why in Haiti we're organizing communities to do something very simple. We get them some tools and they go out to the storm drains and they clear it out of all the debris. So the next time they get heavy rains it won't flood out their village. This is why in Indonesia, a country that was hit hard 10 years ago, earlier this month, 10 years ago, by this amazingly powerful uh, tsunami. This is why we're working with the fishermen there and the fishing communities to do something very simple. We're marking evacuation routes in these communities. We're carving stairs from the beach all the way up to the top of the hill, these very steep, these very steep hills, so that fishermen, when they hear the, si the, they hear the sirens or they get word that a storm is approaching, they can run up safely uh, to a higher ground. And it's too often that we don't get to see the, the results of our preparedness work. It unfortunately takes another disaster to really show did it work, did it not work. One of the biggest examples that I can share with you and one of the most successful is, is in Bangladesh. And if you know Bangladesh, Bangladesh sits at the very top of, of the Bay of Bengal. And unfortunately, whenever there's a storm in the bay, Bangladesh is like a magnet and it seems to head directly towards it. Bangladesh is an incredibly poor community. Much of the country does not have electricity. In 1970, a powerful cyclone hit Bangladesh and killed a half a million people. In 1991, an equally sized powerful storm hit Bangladesh and killed 140,000 people. The American Red Cross got together with the Bangladesh Red Crescent and we established a cyclone preparedness program. Simple things. We built cyclone preparedness shelters. Cement buildings up on stilts. We trained our volunteers, recruited volunteers, and trained them to go door to door, like we're doing in the fire campaign, to talk to families about the importance of getting their own preparedness, getting, making sure their community and their homes are prepared. We equipped our volunteers with bullhorns, and we, we equipped them with bicycles or sirens on their bike. And people knew that if a volunteer was going through their community with a hand crank siren, it means a storm was approaching and they needed to seek safer grounds. Remember, this is a com these are communities without electricity. So we, although, although uh, we have much more sophisticated early warning systems, that hand crank bicycle is the thing that actually helps save lives. So last May, a cyclone was approaching Bangladesh, similar size as we saw in 1970, similar size as we saw in 1991. 50,000 volunteers from the Bangladesh Red Crescent mobilized more than a million people from the coastal community. 50 people died in that event. The same size storm that in 1970 killed a half a million. So one of the other areas that we focus on is preventing diseases. Ebola, measles are ones that I'll talk about. We all have seen the, uh, we've all seen the news and we know about Ebola, 
Let me tell you a little bit about what the Red Cross is doing. There, there's four things that we're focusing in on. The first is prevention messaging. Because we have volunteers coming from these communities and they're not outsiders going into the communities, we can help demystify many of the beliefs there. It's very, very scary in West Africa. There's a lot of errors in some of the things that are, that are being spread. The front page story in the leading Liberian press paper uh, earlier this year, or I should say last year, had a well-known professor claim that it was the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense and the World Health Organization that were spreading Ebola in this country. We had healthcare workers who were being attacked. Red Cross volunteers, when they were going door to door, were being attacked. People are living in fear. So the Red Cross was meeting with these communities and continues to, to share with them what is right and what is wrong, what is real, what is not real, and encouraging them to seek treatment early when they feel sick. The second thing that we focus on is uh, contact tracing and surveillance work. It's the same thing that CDC is doing here and the Department of Health are doing here. When somebody is suspected of having Ebola, the Red Cross goes back and they trace their footsteps. Who did they come in contact with? And then we monitor those people. The third is we've set up some treatment centers to care for the people who have, who, who have been uh, diagnosed with Ebola. And then the fourth, and I would say one of the most important things that the Red Cross is doing, is we're providing safe and dignified burial for people who have died of Ebola or suspect to have had Ebola. This is one of the, this is the most dangerous job right now in West Africa. When somebody dies of Ebola, they become 12 times more infectious than when somebody was alive. We have our volunteers going into the homes taking the bodies, removing the bodies, taking them out, working with these communities who have their own rituals on bathing the, the bodies before burials and trying to work with the families and say that that is not going to be helpful, that we have to work against some of these cultural beliefs. And since the Ebola outbreak started in March last year, the Red Cross volunteers have buried almost 100% of all the people, 8,000 people who have died of Ebola. But we're also seeing a decrease in the number of people going to get treatment for other health issues. People are afraid to go to the hospital. They're afraid to go to the health clinic if they can get to one. They're afraid of being stigmatized, of going to a place that has an Ebola ward, because they may, not be, they may have a flu, but they may not be then welcomed back to their house afterwards. This I consider one of the greatest threats right now of reversing some of the positive health work that has happened in West Africa. We've seen earlier last year a large measles outbreak in Liberia, and that's because the children were not vaccinated. We had a vaccination campaign planned for late last year. We had to delay it because of, because of Ebola. You cannot bring people around uh, and congregate them uh, in the setting. You, people are very fearful of getting a shot and what that may bring. Measles is one of the most dangerous and contagious diseases in the world. We were talking about this at lunch with some, some folks at our table. If one person has measles, they will infect 12 to 18 other people who aren't immune. If I have measles and I sneeze, I probably shouldn't say this on a cruise ship. <laughs> if, if I have measles and I sneeze, 48 hours from now, somebody can walk into this room and they can get measles. It is one of the most deadly diseases in our history. We don't think about that here in the United States. Most of us have been vaccinated. And if we haven't been vaccinated and we do get measles, we have access to strong medical care. And that's not the case in much of the world. <coughs> Fifteen years ago, a half a million children died every year of measles. And this is a disease where there's been a safe, relatively cheap, and highly effective vaccine that's been around for 50 years. But yet, the mother had to make that decision. Does she take her child and bring them to the, the nearest health clinic? Or does she tend to the field and take care of the other things in their community? 
So 14 years ago, the American Red Cross got together with CDC, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, and UN Foundation, and we said we got to stop this. So we got together and we formed the Measles Initiative with one goal. We want to wipe measles off the face of the earth, and we know we can. You, you heard Linda mention it earlier. Over the last 14 years, we vaccinated 1.2 billion children. With that collective purchasing power, we've been able to drive the cost of vaccines down considerably. We've introduced national vaccination campaigns. Over a week or two week period, every child in the country under the age of 15 gets vaccinated. We don't have the mothers have to go out to the nearest health clinic to get their child vaccinated. We're bringing it to them. We're bringing it to those communities and the health clinic may be just sitting at a, a, a little table underneath the tree in the middle of the city, in the middle of the community. And we have our Red Cross volunteers who are going door to door, the same that we're going door to door here in the United States with a fire campaign. And these are people, they're telling the, the, the mothers the importance of getting their child vaccinated. There's the belief that your child, when they become vac vaccinated, they may become sterile. So they're demystifying that. There's fearful, fears that if they get vaccinated, they may become possessed. So we're demystifying that. And this isn't something that you could do or I could do or even someone from the Capitol could go into that community. We're getting the neighbors, the brothers, the cousins, the classmates, the workmates. They're going next to their, their neighbors in their own communities and they're telling them about this. And it's been incredibly successful. We've helped drop measles deaths over this period by 75%. This is one of the greatest health achievements that I would say most people have never heard of before. This is a silent emergency, but this is a silent emergency that we can do something about. In the past year alone, we've seen measles deaths drop from 300, about 430 kids dying a day to 330 kids dying a day. And we need to bring it down to zero, and, and we can. Last year, the World Health Organization adopted a global goal that by 2020, just five years from now, we want to see the last case of measles ever transmitted. Making measles potentially the, only the second disease ever in the history of mankind that's ever been eradicated smallpox being the first. And we're hoping that polio within this period will also be eradicated. But it won't be easy. We've got to maintain the gains that we've seen in places like Africa and Asia. We've got to take head on the largest area where they have measles right now, which is in India. And we've got to address the funding issue too. Over the next five years, it's going to cost us around $70 million as a global community, $70 million a year to wipe out measles forever. So it sounds like a lot of money, but let me put a couple things into perspective. That's about as much money as the Gates Foundation has invested into Ebola over the last year. Ebola, very scary, mysterious disease. It's killed just a little bit more than 8,000 people since March. Measles, on the other hand, we have the technology, we have the know-how, has killed 100,000 people over this period. We've seen the outbreaks in California at a Disneyland. 70 people are di are di have been diagnosed so far with measles. In the United States, on an average year, we see 100 to 150 measles cases. These are travelers who have not been vaccinated who bring it back to their community. Last year, we saw a record year, 700 measles cases in the United States. It costs anywhere between $25,000 and $250,000 to treat one case here in the United States. If you think about that, just do the math, that's another $70,000 that the U.S. has spent just tr treating measles in, in this country. And if we could apply that money to address it at the heart of measles, and within five years, we can wipe that off the earth will never have those costs again. So given the increase in the scope and the complexity of, of disasters and crises around the world, I just want to finish off by sharing with you a little bit about what the Red Cross is doing, how we're adjusting. We have to evolve as well. 
the services that we provide so that we could reach more, that we could do it cheaper, and we can do it faster. So I want to highlight just a few things that we are doing. The first is we're focusing in on urban settings. The world is moving into urban areas. We need to focus in on it. It's incredibly complex working in urban environments. We've seen this in the response to, uh, to Superstorm Sandy. We saw this in the response to Katrina here in the United States. We saw this in, in uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti following the earthquake, where the cities have grown so, so much uh, that the infrastructure hasn't kept pace. In Port-au-Prince, a city that was built for 400,000, had 2 million people living there when the earthquake hit five years ago. One of the challenges we had, as every other relief organization had, was getting through the streets. The streets where homes were built one on top of each other, like they were in Nairobi, where you could stretch out and you could touch both sides. You can't get the bulldozers through there. You can't get the earth moving equipment through there. So the debris had to be picked up. You couldn't even put it on the side of the road. It had to be removed from the hill communities. We're investing in preparedness. Again, here in the United States and around the world, we see the importance of getting families prepared, getting communities prepared before the disaster strikes. We see the success in places like Bangladesh. But we also know it's not just a humanitarian uh, impact. It also makes financial sense. Some of the studies have shown that for every dollar invested in preparedness, there's $4 saved on the response side. So we're investing further into our work there to mobilize communities. And it's a little bit ahead of where um, we are in the development of it. I'll share with you guys, because we're all Red Cross friends and families here, some program that we are working on with a number of other organizations. Later this year, we'll be announcing a huge initiative uh, to prepare one member of every household in the world. Just like we want a smoke detector in every household here, we want every person in the world to have one person who is ready for a disaster, prepared for a disaster. We're going to be partnering with corporations who are going to take on pieces of this goal. We're going to be partnering with other uh, humanitarian agencies, UN agencies. We're calling it right now the One Billion Coalition. So this is a, a, a huge endeavor that we're going to take over the next uh, 10 years to prepare one billion people. To reach more people following the disaster, we're also using mobile technology, cell phones. In the days following the earthquake in Haiti, it was really challenging to bring goods into the port. The, the logistics pipeline was, 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 was uh, uh, overwhelmed. But what we noticed is two days after the earthquake hit, the markets on the side of the road were selling the tarps, the buckets, a lot of the equipment that we were bringing into the country. What we also noticed is, this amazes me, 90% of the families that we were ha helping had access to a cell phone. 90%. So we started working with some of the banks, some of the mobile companies there, and we started sending out text messages that were essentially cash grants. So $25 grants that they could go down to the local market or they'll go down to the local bank and they could convert into cash. And they could go to the market and they could buy what they need it when they need it. They could do it with dignity and they could buy the things that were a necessity to them. <coughs> and it also helped fuel the local economy. So we are using this uh, mobile payment systems all around the world now. And it's something that we're looking at instead of having, I think in maybe five years, instead of us having to bring in all of these goods into the country, is that we will hand out like we did in the Philippines, 70,000 cash grants in the range of 25 to 30, $30 a piece. The other, the final two are also in the technology sphere. So the one is we are mobilizing virtual volunteers. So we all hear about virtual volunteers. And we're crowdsourcing the development of maps that are used for relief and uh, preparedness activities. So by show of hands, who is here has heard of Gulu? I think Linda has saw, heard, heard me talk about this before. So Gulu is the second largest city in Uganda. I didn't know that before someone told me a couple years ago. And Gulu, just like most urban areas, has this great slum that has built up around it. And that slum, these informal communities, had no maps. We could not find a map of it. Downtown Gulu, yes, but not where most of the people were living, not where the most people were working. So Gulu faces two, two uh, hazards. 
One is hut fires and the other one are floods. And the challenge that they had is where they were trying to do a fire campaign and a preparedness campaign and they were taking on the entire community of Gulu. So we had an idea one time uh, or one day and we brought in some students from George Washington University which is right next to our office in Washington. We brought them in over a weekend, we gave them a couple boxes of pizza and we pulled down some satellite images and we broke them up into small little tiles and each of them on their screen had a tile of Gulu, a, ma a satellite view of Gulu. And with their mouse they would trace the roads, they would trace the structures, uh, they would chase, trace the, the water sources, the rivers, the ponds. And by the end of that weekend, we had the first ever detailed map of Gulu. We took that map, we sent it off to our team on the ground, our volunteers. They verified the information. They put street names where there's never been street names before. And they then plotted it against where all of the hut fires had happened over the last two years, where all the floods had happened over the last two years. And you saw on this map this strong area of red where all these things had happened, the concentration area. So we knew that's where we needed to focus. And we could take that map and we handed it off to the authorities, the fire department, the fire brigade, so that when there was a disaster, people could call up on their cell phone and they say, we need to get to the corner of 5th and Main. And now people knew where the corner of 5th and Main were. And we trained motorcycle taxi drivers to be first aid ambulances, essentially. These motorcycle drivers are all over the place. So we now trained them and now they knew where to go to provide emergency relief. Last year, I should say uh, in late 2013, when the typhoon hit the Philippines, we faced a similar situation where there wasn't a map of this area. In fact, the last map that was created of the Philippines in the, country, in the parts of the country where we were working was done by the U.S. Army during World War II. So we put a call out there virtually and over the course of 48 hours we had 1,600 virtual volunteers from 90 countries pulling down piece tiles of a satellite map and tracing the roads, marking where it looked like bridges were out, tracing structures that looked like they were, were damaged. And we were handing it out to the team on the ground. I've got three people, three professional mappers on my team back in Washington. They did in 48 hours what it would have taken my mapping team three to four years to do. Those maps reduced the time to get to different communities. It helped us identify which were the most in need, similar to what we've done in West Africa. And what we have a program now that we launched a couple months ago. It's called the Missing Maps Project. It's a partnership that we have with Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontier, with a, and a group called also the Humanitarian Open Street Map. And we have a commitment to map the one, top 100 vulnerable cities, vulnerable communities in the world over the next three years. And we're going to do this with our virtual volunteers. We're going to be working with our chapters to reach out to their communities, to reach out to workplaces, Mapping is something that you can do with 15-minute online tutorial. It's really easy. My 12-year-old son's doing it. If I could get him to focus it on mapping rather than Minecraft, I mean, we'll have the whole world mapped pretty soon. Uh, it, it, the final one that I want to talk about is what we're focusing in on emerging technology. The Red Cross, like a lot of other humanitarian organizations, is a bit late on adopting technology. Ma apps. Apps we think are the greatest thing. Apps have been around for y a decade or more. Uh, we need to focus in on those things that are coming on online right now. So over the last, nine, uh, last seven months, we've had a series of conversations in Silicon Valley and uh, the tech capitals of the world. We've gone to Seoul, to Buenos Aires, to, to London, um, to Dublin. And we've had meetings with the tech community, with humanitarian organizations, with governments. And we've learned a little bit more about 3D printing, biometrics, augmented reality, Google Glass. Uh, we've learned about robotics. We've learned about sensors. And we've had conversations with communities and we've had conversations with this tech community about their application in a humanitarian setting. 
how can we use 3D printing? Instead of us having to bring goods into a country, can we print a bucket? Can we print a hammer? So we're now moving into a phase where we're going to be piloting some of these things. We're going to be testing them in these communities. We're looking at drones that can go up into the sky when uh, the electricity goes out and communications goes out, and they can act as a, three, as a, uh, a cell tower. Uh, so really cool, cool things that most people don't think the Red Cross is that involved with. So I think in a moment we'll have a chance to, for some questions. But one of the questions that I, that I often get is, Luke, you've been doing this for 20 years. You see some of the greatest tragedies in the world. What motivates you, you to continue on? And I, easy response. And I'm sure most Red Crossers would have a very similar response. Because I think I actually have the greatest job in the world. I see every single day, Linda is complaining that she thinks she has the greatest job. And Margaret will be next. And I think it's very similar because while we do get exposed to some, some uh, pretty bad stuff, we're also exposed to some pretty great things. The hope, the care, the humanity at its best. And we see this in the courage of our volunteers in Syria, in West Africa. We see this in the volunteers here in the Tampa area who last night went out in the middle of the night to, to respond to five fires. We see this in our volunteers, the college students, who are giving up their Friday night to map a city that they've never heard of before. And we see this in the Red Cross friends, you guys, who are, also, who are demonstrating your care and your compassion in such important ways to help the Red Cross. So to me, it's a huge privilege to be able to be exposed to all this great stuff every year. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for being part of the Red Cross team. Thank you very much.